Well, thank you guys very much for joining us today on a um, Wednesday night to try to get educated on acquiring financial security, investing in promissory notes. Uh, my name is Matthew Owens. I am a California licensed CPA and a full-time real estate investor. Uh, I quit my CPA firm job about 10 years ago now, uh, and I've never looked back. It's uh, it, it's definitely uh, go up and you do take your ups and downs in real estate, and it's been an amazing journey learning all the new tools. And uh, I'm here to teach you guys a little bit about uh, one segment of investing in the real estate asset class, uh, which is investing in uh, promissory notes. And uh, it's one of the most important things I believe to learn is how financing works, how to create your own financing, how to actually create financing for others, and uh, how to actually buy and sell promissory notes and invest in them, and how to protect yourself. You know, many people when they're investing in a new asset class don't have all the, that understanding. And so I'm here basically today to show you that show you some of the different things that we invest in and I invest in at OCG Properties and try to show you uh, so a new strategy, a new way of looking at things that you may not have seen before. So um, I'm going to get right into it again just to give you a little bit of background. I was on the cover of Forbes magazine with Jay-Z. Yes, that's me. And, uh, you know, it was an amazing experience. But, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, Jay-Z, he, he doesn't make as much money as me. So, you know, He's not, uh, he's not in my status yet, but, you know, I'm getting there, or he's getting there with me. So, but anyways, so thanks to my Photoshop editor on this one. So that, that's actually uh, Warren Buffett's body on, the, on that uh, picture that my, my, uh, uh, one of my guys here helped me out with. So uh, who is OCG Properties? Uh, we've bought and sold over 500 houses in the last 10 years. We're buying about 5 to 10 properties a month right now, and we're raising over $45 million in uh, private investor capital. Uh, we, uh, right now, I, I have uh, probably am utilizing around $15 million of private investors' capital uh, at any one time, and I raise about $500,000 a month for different investments that I do and my investors do, and I help them invest in different strategies. I currently manage a portfolio of over 200 units out in the Memphis, Tennessee market, uh, both single and, and smaller multifamily properties. Uh, we, uh, and I own a renovation and management company out in the Memphis, Tennessee market where, where my primary investment base is. Even though I invest, you know, or I invest in Memphis, but I live in Southern California uh, where, you know, you, you invest where it makes sense and you, you live where you want to live. Nobody can get over the California weather. It's pretty amazing. So uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara uh, and graduated in accounting. And so I have a lot of accounting and real estate experience. My first uh, company, my first CPA firm that I worked for, uh, I focused on one of the largest real estate clients uh, that, uh, that the firm had, which they bought multifamily buildings across the country uh, and they needed to get audits because they had a lot of the government subsidy and things like that associated with them. So I got to go in and look at all the numbers. I know that sounds absolutely exciting as hell, right, to go through there and, and nitpick at every number there is on a multifamily building, I know. But at the same time, uh, I realized at those firms that I was sitting on the wrong side of the table, sitting at these company meetings where uh, they were talking about buying multi-million dollar buildings without blinking and just relying on their CEOs to handle it and take care of it for them. So uh, I decided to jump into real estate and learn more. Uh, and and really really get involved in this and you know since then we've done quite a bit of business uh, we I focus a lot on the real estate taxation taxation side with my clients I do a lot of the commercial and residential investment analysis a lot of investors bring their investments to me to help them kind of mitigate the risks help them with the due diligence aspects how to structure their deals from uh, an entity structuring component as well as a you know profit split component when you're bringing in different investors into the into the pie. So we do a lot of lending consulting, and you know I help people understand the true cash flows and what the true analysis should look like. And we do a lot of this as well through these types of educational events where we just teach other investors how to do this. And we we invest in syndications, we raise money for syndications, and do quite a bit on the syndicated realm as well, which is just a pooling of investors' funds into one LLC or one entity for a common purpose of, you know, buying a building or investing in a specific asset class. 
Uh, I do a lot of, on my accounting experience, I did a lot of corporate and individual taxation. Uh, I focused on audit and tax, so I got both sides of things, as well as I would help companies with their internal controls and help them actually go through and find the fraud risk factors inside their businesses and find ways to proper segregate duties and help them structure their businesses for success. What we do at OCG, we actually buy a single family and multifamily properties and we invest in promissory notes uh, as well as syndicated investments. We create our own promissory notes. We actually leverage our promissory notes. There's a lot of different strategies that you can use and different ways to invest in promissory notes that we'll go over in a little bit later. But our primary uh, focus is uh, investing in the asset class of single family and multifamily real estate. And along with that, uh, promissory notes are then created, of course. Most of our value add is through uh, renovation, proper renovation, management, the leasing aspect of things, and those efficiencies that go along with buying and renovating and operating uh, multifamily and single family homes as well as other investment types. So we really focus on this. Uh, we help our investors along the way and back up all of our, all of our documentation. Passive cash flow, we provide uh, a, a passive cash flow for our investors and ourselves uh, to help our investors and ourselves create that financial freedom we're all striving for. We are so focused on creating that financial freedom to uh, get out of the rat race and build our monthly, ex our monthly income so it can be higher than our expenses. And we have a ton of different ways that we do that for our clients on a consistent, uh, consistent monthly basis where we sit down with clients every day going over their, their financial situation, what their goals are, and how to help them. And so we help them with the tax planning and the entity structuring, like I mentioned, and then we also do uh, different bookkeeping services for them. And then we help actively manage property managers as part of our part of our services. This is very, very difficult. We went through five management companies before finding the right ones that work for us and bringing one in in-house as well as having one exterior to us that we have a lot of control over. So it, management will make or break your investment and we really focus on that aspect which we think is the most important thing. So what are we going to go over today? So first is why cash flow investing in the first place? What's the goal behind all of this? Okay? And then why notes? You know, why this asset class is unique. It is very unique. You find that uh, many experienced investors, after investing in real estate for years, start investing in promissory notes, you know, due to the lack of headache or uh, them not wanting to deal with tenants, toilets, and termites anymore and, and having, uh, you know, multiple headaches. Whenever you own a property, you do own, you do owe, uh, uh, own something that is, causes problems sometimes that need a decision to be made, whether that's, you or your manager that's doing that is a different thing, but you need to be able to make sure you understand what those decisions are, whether you're manage, you have a manager in place or not. Uh, what are the different note strategies that, we, that you can implement? So there's a ton of different strategies to implement. How to mitigate taxes and invest in notes through your IRA. Timing the actual real estate market. This is a very key tarp topic and very difficult to gauge. The only thing you really can do is pay attention to the data constantly looking at the data and trying to uh, trying to determine at what point the tipping point will happen uh, and you know right now fortunately it doesn't seem like there's going to be any major faltering at least according to the data of course there's major outside factors that could come in so it's it's very hard to predict uh, finding where the right investment is for you so a lot of investors have completely different risk tolerance levels completely different ideas of what they should or shouldn't be investing in and they have different resources as well so there's a ton of things that go into finding the right investment for you as a person um, and you as a for for your family and your individual financial situation so and then finally we'll go over a little bit about how to make money with us in different ways very briefly to kind of show you the different strategies we deploy and how we work with different investors in a multitude of different ways. So hopefully I add some great value for you guys today uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into it so that everybody can go watch the playoff game. So 
uh, why investing in why invest in cash flow investing? So you know, there's capital gains and then there's cash flow. And you know, capital gains are important to invest for, but at the same time, uh, they are not passive. Most capital gains um, are non-passive types type, types of investments. Most people might invest in California for the capital gains versus the cash flow because they think it goes up more than than uh, other markets around the country. And and sometimes it does. At this time in the market, I would really, really uh, doubt that it would be going up, uh, uh, that, that it would be a good idea to invest for strictly capital gains in, in California right now. Uh, in this kind of a market, I think it's extremely important to make sure your investments cash flow um, from the start right now without actually, um, without relying on capital gains to make your, your income. So cash, to me, I believe in cash flow first and then capital gains second. Because when you're investing for cap for cash flow, you can cover all your monthly expenses and then give you that power to then go out afterwards and invest in you know more uh, uh, more asset classes or more strategies that are are, are capital gain focused or uh, more actively focused. I think it's a great idea to do both if you're fixing and flipping and adding cash flow too. But uh, anything for long term capital gains, uh, you may want to reconsider at, at this time currently. So. Um, unless you have some great built-in equity or uh, something along those lines, especially in California. What is the goal? So let's, right now, your goal is to cover all of your monthly expenses. And, and if I'm wrong, definitely tell me, but I highly doubt that most people's goal is not to cover all their monthly expenses with cash flow, okay? So uh, if you, and, and keep in mind, if you have $6,000 a month of living expenses, which a lot of us have a lot more than that, but if you have $6,000 a month living expenses, you really want to have closer to 10000 a month in cash flow from your investments coming in. And why is that? It's because you want to be able to outpace inflation, outpace uh, your spending. You don't want to just constantly be you know, only making 6000 a month because over time your expenses will rise. And if your cash flow doesn't rise with it, uh, then you have a big problem. And so I always want you to have more money so that you can constantly reinvest as inflation happens and those expenses continuously rise. So what is the big problem? The big, biggest problem is that these old investment methods really don't work. And so if you look at the true picture of where our economy is at and where people are right now, 1% uh, of them are self-sustaining. 16% of them are still working. 31% are dependent on relatives. And 52% are dependent on charity. So, you know, this is a big problem. And it's all because people were slowly investing in these other big investment houses that control your education. You do not get above inflationary returns on your money. Uh, you need to be able to leverage your, your assets to be able to increase your return on investment and, and keep that return at a higher than inflation uh, uh, inflationary return. Otherwise, you're losing purchasing power. So putting money into a CD at 1% when inflation is what is stated at three, but is actually higher than that. Um, but uh, if you're putting your money in there and your inflation's three and you're getting one, you're losing purchasing power. You're locking in your money to lose. So keep these types of things in mind. The, the education you've gotten so far uh, for from all these big investment companies in Money Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine and all those types of companies uh, and, and news sources really are all geared towards you giving uh, these big investment companies your capital to invest uh, so that they make money, but they don't pay you your fair share. They make money whether you make money in or not in trades and things like that. And so it needs to be uh, aligned. Would you make a business decision or uh, uh, go into a business where your interest is not aligned with the person you're investing with? You want to make sure that uh, that is the case every time. So why notes? This is the, the magic question, and I think notes have a huge, uh, uh, a huge. They should be a huge part of your portfolio. Okay, and let's go over some of the pros and the cons of notes. And you know, the first quote that I have here is understanding the note investing, how to protect yourself, and how to create cash flow streams in various forms. Secured against hard assets is one of the most powerful and fastest methods to financial freedom, and it really is. If you learn how to leverage notes and you learn how to buy and sell uh, you know, underperforming or non-performing paper or buy performing paper already up and running, you can create passive cash flow streams 
to get you to a, a place that uh, you know you you couldn't imagine how 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 easy it is to start developing these these different cash flow streams and putting them in place. So. Uh, I, I do this constantly where I'm constantly buying new notes and new paper and then I collateralize that paper and, uh, and at the same time sometimes I invest 100% of my cash. I also invest in, in, in single family homes and multifamilies to diversify because notes are not inflationary, right? So you want to be very careful and buy some inflationary assets like real estate that go up with inflation and some assets that provide more cash flow like notes. So some of the positives of notes is the stability of the cash flow stream. So you have uh, a very stable cash flow. It doesn't fluctuate like rents do or you know it doesn't decrease when you have repairs or property taxes that are insurance to pay. You've got a pretty much a very secure uh, payment if you do it correctly. So you have short-term and long-term notes. You can invest in you know one-year or six-month notes. You can invest in five-year, 10-year, 30-year notes. It, there's an array of different terms that you can invest in, and each term has a different type of property uh, that that goes with. Okay, so very very important when you're you're looking at this stuff. Uh, property collateral. Very, you actually have a piece of collateral, a hard asset that you know you, you have backing your investment. So even if you know, say say you have a a, a promissory note secured against a property that's a hundred thousand bucks, and you have a loan for seventy five. If that asset goes down by 10%, you're not financially harmed. Now it goes down by 25%, then you're at break even point. And so only in some of the biggest markets across the nation, like California and certain like Riverside, San Bernardino, some of those outskirts, that it really crashed by that much, uh, you know, for the long term. And so, uh, and just because the real estate market crashes doesn't necessarily mean that your note is going to be non-performing or have a problem. People that live in these homes and that own these assets are doing so for an either investment purposes or for living purposes. And so, uh, if and there's emotional ties to that to that financial situation, including money down into the deal, including you know home ownership and living in a property has a lot of emotional equity tied in there. So there are no tenants, termites, or toilets. You don't have to deal with that headache. Uh, now you do need to go and make sure you understand the property in itself and what problems exist with it. Okay, so proper ca cash flow planning. You can, uh, if you have a long enough note, uh, you can properly ca uh, plan your current cash flow. You have a mix of short term and long term notes, so you can really gauge what your cash flow stream is going to be in the long run. You have less headaches because it's basically mailbox money. You get checks in the mail. So normally you set up a servicer that will come in and, and buy these notes from you or, or actually service these notes. Or you can service them yourself and either get a check in the mail or an automatic deposit into your bank account. So uh, it's actually pretty simple. You don't have to deal with the headaches of the property. So that, that goes with the property owner. So some of the cons. Like I mentioned, it is not an inflation hedge. Okay, so as inflation happens, that payment becomes worth wor uh, uh, worse of a payment over the long run. So it becomes worth less. And so uh, you want to be, be very careful uh, when investing in very long term type notes, you know, 30 year type notes that a 4% interest rate may not be the best idea in the world right now, given that, you know, we're at historically low rates and in the future, we'll, they will probably go up in the long run. So that 4% rate may not be that great. Uh, foreclosure costs. The foreclosure aspects of things depend on the state that you're doing business in. So certain states cost more money. They have different rules and regulations when you're dealing with foreclosures. In the state of Tennessee, it cost me fifteen hundred or two thousand bucks to foreclose, and no more than a couple months to get that property back deeded to me if there's a foreclosure. So there's very very uh, good foreclosure laws in that state. Uh, I, I don't know what they are in California, uh, but I know that the regulations are much worse in California than most states. So uh, bankruptcy issues, if a, if a, a homeowner goes bankrupt, bankrupt or uh, a uh, or a investor that you're loaning it to goes bankrupt, you have the right to that collateral. Uh, and there's different things in place if it's an investment property that protects you to be able to make it so you can collect rents directly so you can still continue to get paid on your note, even if there's a drawn out bankruptcy or you know some major issue with the property. 
you have to do your due diligence. It's much harder to do the due diligence on a note unless you really understand the paperwork involved. And we'll touch on the paperwork as well here too. So that way you have a really good understanding of what paperwork should exist when you're investing in these notes. So the due diligence, you're looking at all that paperwork and trying to understand it. Uh, a lot of times it's really good to have an attorney involved that can review that stuff. Uh, the Dodd-Frank and the SAFE Act, very new laws that, are, that have came out lately, um, and well, actually they're a couple years old now, uh, but what happens is they, they primarily relate to when you are uh, doing loans to homeowners. When you're dealing with uh, commercial financing, financing investors, you don't really have to worry about these types of laws. When you're financing homeowners, there's a whole new set of laws that has to go into place including getting a national mortgage licensed originator to originate the loan for you uh, and make sure that they have all the paperwork and that person qualifies. So, th And there's different state laws as well when it comes to notes. You want to understand that. So, for example, in, in Florida, it's a judicial foreclosure state, which means that you have to sue them to foreclose. In Tennessee, it's a non-judicial foreclosure state, so you don't have to sue. You can just foreclose under the, under the rights of the deed of trust. So, and take it to an attorney and they can help you foreclose if there's a default in place. Uh, property repairs. So, one thing with notes that you want to be careful of is these types of property repairs. If you're buying a note, you want to do the due diligence on the underlying asset that you uh, have as collateral to make sure, does it need a new roof soon? Does it need an HVAC system? Does it need uh, you know, paint and carpet? Does it need major systems that are going to cost a lot of money to fix? Because if you do have to foreclose and if there is an issue on that property, you want to make sure that that property is a valuable property that you're not going to have to put a ton of money into. And if you do have to put money into it, then you want to understand how much money and how much and what it's going to cost and make sure that you can get all of your money back on that investment. So uh, it's actually really important to make sure that you understand the collateral involved in your promissory note. Okay. That's what protects you. Okay, so now let's let's go over some of the uh, some of the specific uh, paperwork involved and ways to protect yourself when you're investing in a promissory note. Okay, first thing is understand the promissory note in the first place. Okay, so read the promissory note, understand the late provisions, take it to an attorney if you if you're not comfortable doing this yourself, making sure that it's in compliance with that attorney's comfort level as well or your attorney's comfort level um, is important. Make sure you understand all of the provisions in the note and it has the collateral list in the, in there. This is the contract. This is what governs the overall transaction and says. This is the term, this is the interest rate involved, uh, this is the collateral involved, it's everything that outlines your entire situation, okay? A deed of trust. So this is what secures your money against the property. And in a judicial foreclosure state, it's a mortgage, okay? So in, in a non-judicial, it's a deed of trust. So the deed of trust is what gets secured at the recorder's office to record, uh, uh, to secure your money against that property, okay, to make sure that you have a collateral interest in that property and the property can't be sold without the deed of trust getting released by you. So if you, uh, you have to sign what's called a, a trust deed release when you get your money or when the closing agent is giving you your money so that that way you're releasing the deed of trust from the property once you get paid off. Okay, the assignment of rents and leases, great for investment property. If you have an investor that has a property that's rented and they are not paying you, you have what's called an assignment of rents and leases that can be recorded at the recorder's office. And so if they don't pay you, they you can collect the rents directly by, by uh, enacting your rights under the assignment of rents and leases here. Okay. Uh, title insurance, you want to make sure you have free and clear title to the property and there's no liens on the property. So the very important. Insurance, uh, you want to be put as the lost pay on the policy. If there's a fire uh, it, or something like that on the property, you don't want the owner to get the actual uh, uh, money. You want to be paid your loan first or at least know that it's going back into repairing that property okay, and held in an escrow account or something along those lines. Unless you have a good relationship and you can trust them then, uh, then you know, and gotten your money back multiple times, then there, there's exceptions to every rule. Uh, positioning. 
So are you in first or second or third or fourth position or fifth up, up through a million? You know, you can be, there's multiple positions involved, and it's really important to understand what position you are. So first position gets paid first, second posi position gets paid second, and so on. What is your loan to value? So if your property is worth $100,000 and you loan 75, your loan to value is 75% of the market value. Okay, so um, I think 80% to 75 to 80% is probably the max you want to do on a flip transaction uh, on, on, you know, depending on the market that you're in and your relationships involved. Uh, collateral and, and due diligence. So you want to make sure, like I mentioned, that you do the due diligence on that property. Have a realtor go buy it. See if, see if you can understand what repairs exist or if it's dilapidated on the outside. Sometimes it's vacant and it's very hard to make these types of determinations, but you can get this from the seller of the note. You might be able to get this from uh, the person living in the property. There's a lot of different things, the ways you can get this, including having backup documentation in place. Uh, inflation. So make sure you're making above inflationary returns, like I mentioned, very important. The assignment of deed of trust. This, if I loan money to someone else and I want to sell that loan off, so say I loan $50,000 to somebody on a property that's worth $100,000, and I want my $50,000 back even though, or I need it back for some reason, even though uh, my loan is not due for a couple years, then I can sell that loan off to another party, anybody I want to, and I give them what's called an assignment of a uh, uh, deed of trust. And that what happens is we sign a purchase agreement just like we would sign a property purchase agreement. We, and then I give them the assignment of deed of trust and, and a launch, which basically assigns my rights in that deed of trust to them. So they now will own the promissory note and the deed of trust. So a lot of people think that notes are not freely transferable. They are absolutely freely transferable. So you, it's a very, very great strategy to use this to be able to sign notes and move funds around if you need to. So you can get out if there's issues like that. Uh, lending to professionals versus beginners. Okay, You are going to get a better rate when you are uh, lending to beginners because Quite frankly, they don't know what they're doing all the time. And so if the, the beginner is not going to have the capital resources available uh, that the more experienced person is going to have, and so you can get those types of rates. Plus, uh, it's a little bit riskier, right, because they have, don't have the experience uh, investing. So you always want to understand uh, the experience of who you're lending to, if it's on an investment side, um, or understand you know the down payments and, and, and debt-to-income ratios of of the homeowners if you're buying homeowner financing, okay? So let's go over some of the documentation a little bit. And I'm going to breeze through this because it's long and boring and not fun to go through a bunch of uh, words and documentation, okay? But it's important, and I'll give you guys these slides later on. You can take a look at them. But uh, so there's uh, we sell properties, and then through that we sell properties to a lot of our international clients. And so there's a, a, a slew of uh, documentation and issues that goes around selling to international clients, okay, including tax treaties and translations and tax ID numbers and things like that that need to get need to get completed. Um, and then you also want to look at the loan documentation, okay? So whenever you're financing anybody and selling to any or, or financing any kind of investor, you want to get backup of your loan documentation. The promissory note, the assignment of rents and leases, all the things we just went over um, are important to make sure you have the backup, okay? What we do is we always lend, when we lend, when we're doing uh, financing for commercial purposes, for someone to rent a property or for someone to fix and flip a property, we always get a disclaimer that says that they uh, cannot live in the property because there's different laws when they're uh, lending to uh, homeowners versus, versus uh, investors. So we say for commercial purposes only. When we are selling to homeowners, it's a whole nother animal now when the SAFE Act and, and Dodd-Frank is out at, back. So you want to go through and make sure, like I said, you have a national mortgage license originator and you understand the laws in each state. 
So, and you have to have the proper loan documentation, set up credit repair in place if you need to, um, or help those investors along or those home, sorry, those homeowners along. Uh, and then usually uh, you, you can, we do a lot of financing with no money down to our homeowners uh, if they've been in a property with us for a long period of time where we can structure it where their monthly loan payments are the same as their rent amounts. And so it's a win-win for both parties. We get a higher rate on our money uh, and they get a home that they're going to be into, uh, they're going to own for 30 years. And if they refinance, their payment goes down substantially. So there's some great strategies when liquidating properties to homeowners. Note maintenance, so property taxes and insurance, you want to make sure those are paid consistently. Uh, when someone's ready to pay you off, you have to do a payoff and, and, and you have to actually have a servicer involved if you're not servicing it yourself. Uh, that helps basically collect the payments and do the 1099s and the 1098s and things like that for tax compliance. And then when a property gets paid off, like I mentioned, you have to do those releases uh, that, uh, to, to, to release the lien from the property once you're paid. So selling a note on the secondary market, like I said, you give them the assignment of deeds and trusts. Um, you compile the projections, the comparable sales, all the property and loan documentation and amortization schedules. And there's a big checklist that goes along with this to make sure that you have all the documentation involved. Uh, and then we use the 10 BII financial calculator when we're selling properties off uh, to determine what the interest rate is and things like that and create an amortization schedule for our clients. So, and what we do a lot of is I, like I mentioned, if I go loan money at a, at, you know, call it, say I loan $100,000, I can go borrow, say, $75,000 out of that $100,000 uh, and still uh, make, a, make a good spread on my money and, and borrow it at a lesser rate and make even more money on my money, which I'll show you an example of in a little bit. So let's go over the note strategies. This is actually really cool. Um, the different strategies to use, there, there's a ton of different strategies that you can implement depending on how long you want to invest, your risk tolerance level. And so the very first type is fix and flip notes, okay? So you have uh, notes, lo these are loans that you're actually loaning to people that, uh, or if you're borrowing from somebody else as well, uh, where you are loaning it to them so that they can renovate the property and flip it, okay? So some people will loan 100% of the cost. Some people will loan 90% of the cost. Some will loan 75% of your cost. It all depends on the person's risk tolerance level. Most of the time, these loans are six months to a year or a year and a half max, depending on how big of a project and if it's a development or not and things like that. So there's a, a lot of different factors to go in this, but they can be very short-term in nature. Okay, uh, for these these fix and flip notes, uh, rental property notes. Typically, uh, investors can buy uh, notes that are that are owned. The properties are owned by by investors that want to want to basically own these for cash flow. And so, there's a lot of these types of notes available where uh, the investor is making that owns the property is making you know one one piece of it, one type of income and rental income, and then paying his loan off as well. So one of the things we do is we do a lot of seller financing to our international clients and, and do seller financing and create these rental property notes. And I'll show you an example in, in a little bit. Financing homeowners, like I talked about, that whole slew of, of different requirements under Dodd-Frank and the SAFE Act, very important. Non-performing notes. So a lot of times people buy pools of non-performing notes. Now when you're buying these types of notes, I think it's very important to buy them in pools because one note could could go down and, and wipe you out completely. So you want to be very, very careful when you're buying these non-performing notes and understand the laws in that state so that you know what your rights are to be able to collect. And so when you're buying non-performing notes, it's much better to buy a pool because there's always a certain percentage that don't perform and it's not worth it necessarily to go after them legally uh, to get your money back because of the legal costs involved um, if you're having to foreclose in, in certain circumstances. Uh, and that's usually with low value type notes like 20,000, 30,000 type notes. Uh, performing notes. So there's a ton of performing notes out there. There's a whole market for it that you can actually invest in uh, where they've been seasoned for you know a year or two years or more and then you can buy these. A lot of people invest and own notes. Uh, it's just rare to see them uh, from the big investment companies that don't necessarily allow you to invest in those. So re-performing notes as well. Um, notes that used to be defaulting and now 
uh, someone bought them and got them re-performing by saying, hey, your monthly payment is $2,000 a month. If I and, and if I made it $1,500 a month, would you be able to handle it? Um, and a lot of these different homeowners will automatically take that and they reposition it. And the person involved that bought the note can do that because they got a big discount on that non-performing note previously. Uh, seller financing, we do a lot of seller finance paper to our international clients. And then hypothecating the, the note is just basically collateralizing or selling a piece of that note off. So you can borrow funds against your note or you can go through and say, I have a 30-year note. I'm going to go sell the first 10 years of payments off and get all my money back. And then I'm just going to keep the last 20 years of payments. There's things like that that you can do uh, when you're investing in notes and selling portions of the payment off okay so you just have to understand how that works so here's an example of one of the notes that we did where we had an investor buy this property from us for a hundred and forty five thousand dollars and put eighty five thousand dollars down okay so we gave them a loan and after we gave them that loan um, they owed us sixty thousand they owed us sixty thousand right now they've paid it down to about fifty six thousand dollars we gave them a seven year loan amortized over 15 years with a balloon payment at the end of seven. So you see the $41,000 uh, amount here under the profit, profit analysis. Uh, that amount specifically is the, is, the, is the amount of the balloon. And so uh, after, after making payments of 574, 573 a month for uh, a seven year term, they owe us a balloon of $41,000 after that so um, and normally they'll either refinance or sell the property off um, or just pay us off with cash at that point so these are great because look at this it's 38.83 percent loan to value here uh, which is a really really safe investment do you think this guy is ever going to default on his his investment by putting eighty five thousand dollars down and if i had to foreclose and it cost me fifteen hundred to two thousand bucks to foreclose I could care less because I could go resell the property for 145000 and make a great profit. So I'm very, very protected in this type of scenario. So promissory notes, normally when we're doing these, we pay 6 to 8% interest rates on our investments. We have that equity protection, and there's some great benefits along with it. This is an example of one, which is a five-year term at 8%. It's at 64% or 63.64% of the market value of the property. It's a, a, a $165,000 property. This one is taken already, uh, but uh, keep in mind these types of investments are available on a consistent basis when we buy five to 10 houses a month consistently for these. So when we're making a spread, we're making a spread on the cash flow. So if we're paying $700 a month in cash flow and, you know, our gross rents are $1,550, so call it, you know, nine, $900 to $1,200 a month in uh, gross revenue, uh, depending on repairs and vacancy and all that, those factors, then we're still making a very good spread on, on our investment. Here's another, another investment. This is a fix and flip deal that's a one-year term on the deal at 8%. Um, it's making $492 a month in cash flow, and it's at about a 77.63% uh, loan to value. And what we do is we buy these, we renovate them, and we tenant them, and then we resell them primarily to either other investors or we do joint ventures with our investors on these as well where we will partner with them and not make a uh, markup at all. So uh, we do a number of different structures and we're working on different blanket packages and things like that on, uh, on multiple properties as well as our exit strategies. So there's a number of exit strategies involved that we can deploy depending on the asset and, and, and what's involved. So this is an example of seller financing to a homeowner that is really, really exciting because, and I'm trying to break down the math to you guys so you guys can really understand it in detail. So I bought this property for $67,000. Um, I had some rehab and other costs. I'm in it for $76,000, $400. And it rents for $950 a month. So after I'm going to go sell it to my tenant for $99,750 at a 9.25% interest rate. And I'm going to go give them a 30-year term on it, which their loan payment of 821 on that 9.25% rate over 30 years, that the payment's 821 a month, with taxes and insurance, with their total payment is $999 a month, which is only a $49 difference 
from their current rent. Now this property, this person's been in the property for over six months, has not missed a single payment, qualified with a debt to income ratio of lower than 33%. So they're very, very qualified. Um, they just had um, some, some financial issues previously for some medical issues um, and when the market crashed previously. So, um, so what we're doing is we're putting a credit repair person in place to help them with their situation and get them refinanced because if they refinance, their monthly payment goes down substantially because it goes from a 9.25% rate to, you know, maybe a 4% rate or something along those lines. And so if we look at our OCG's cost here, so I'm in it for 76.4 plus closing costs minus the security deposit that I make the tenant apply. I'm really in it for 77.850, okay? Um, and I'm borrowing these funds at an 8% rate, which is um, I'm, my monthly payment is $571 a month. So I could be in it all cash, and I'd be making 9.25% on my 99.750 uh, loan, okay? But I, I chose to go through and raise the funds on this at 8% and secure my, my and leverage my promissory note to this seller, to, to, the, to the, um, uh, the buyer, the homeowner in this place. And so I, I'm making a payment of 571 a month, but actually getting a payment of 821 a month. So I'm making 250 a month or about three grand a year on my profits that I financed. And so let's look at the numbers on this. If I'm in it, if I'm selling for 99,750 minus closing costs, sale commissions, I'm, I'm, I was expected to net about 15 grand on this, which is about a 19% return on my $76,000 cost. Now when I'm selling to a tenant, I don't have sales commissions. And so my profit's about $21,000. So that's a 27% uh, return on my cost, okay? Now I'm making three grand on this. So I'm making three grand a year on my 15 grand that I would have made, which is a 20% return on investment. If I'm doing it on my $21,000 that I'm currently making in this strategy, it's about a 14% return on investment on my profits that I borrowed or that, that I loaned. So you can see how by borrowing money at cheaper rates um, that you're making, you can make the investor involved a good return at 8%, and you can still make really high rates as well by collateralizing your investment, okay? So it's a great strategy. Now this, this could go on for 30 years, and I'm in the process right now of getting this rate down to in the 5% range from some, some different banks that I'm working with, some local lenders. Could you imagine what my return on investment is going to be when that happens? It's going to be pretty amazing uh, when you start to see the, the strategies involved. So let's talk about everyone's favorite subject, mitigating taxes. Uh, you know, with, with the, the, the politics happening now and the new changes and, and you know, uh, who's in power, it's going to be pretty interesting what's going to be happening down the pike when it comes to taxes. So let's talk about things you can control, though, in the form of mitigating taxes. So first, you got to track every dollar you can spend, uh, you spend on a monthly and annual basis. So this uh, will really, really help with really getting down to the nitty gritty of what you spend, what your budget is, and what your goal is, right? You have to know what your budget is and what you spend every month to know what your goal is to cover with cash flow. If you don't know that, then you have big problems. You have to know where you're going to get, get, get there in the first place. Look at your budget versus actual on a monthly basis, if not every couple weeks. Look at where you're at compared to your budget. This is very important. Set up a meeting with your wife or your significant other and, and actually go through and sit down and go over your budget. I don't care if you have to hire a virtual assistant to go through every transaction on your credit cards and every bank account uh, that you have on all, all of your statements and line out your entire budget. It's the most important thing you can do to track this and know exactly where you're at, okay? Having those proper bookkeeping controls in place and, and having reports on your desk every two weeks or every month is extremely important. And I can tell you a lot of people, probably 90% of the people that I talk to, do not go do quarterly tax planning with a good CPA. So I don't personally do this, so I have no vested interest in you doing this, but I'm telling you right now, every dollar that you pay in, uh, in getting this with a good CPA, uh, you're gonna triple at least by going to someone getting the proper tax planning uh, that you should do in tax savings. So learn what entities are best to mitigate taxes, and it depends on the type of income you're making, okay? So typically, 
when you're dealing with um, active income, like flipping prop, well, flipping continuously when you're a dealer, or you know, working for somebody else, or w working for a 1099 where you're actively trading your time for money, there's payroll taxes involved. And so, for me personally, the reason I say uh, dealer status is because once you do a certain amount of flips on an annual basis you're considered a dealer where it's ordinary income instead of capital gains income. Okay, so once you do too much, you start to it starts to become ordinary income to you. So uh, capital gains, there are no payroll taxes. So you can do all capital gains inside of an LLC or all passive income like rental income or notes in an LLC because there's no payroll taxes associated with it. Whenever you're dealing with active income, you want to put it into an an S corporation as long as your net income is high enough to make it make sense to pay the money for a corporation versus just doing it in your own name. Okay, because there's typically when you're forming an entity it might cost, you know, uh, call it 3000 bucks or something like that in a year, you know, 2000 to 3000 bucks a year just to keep your OLC up and running or your S corporation up and running and moving. And sometimes unless you're making a good chunk of money inside of it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to form an entity in the first place. Don't listen to the attorneys all the time that tell you form an entity. Look at the cost benefit analysis between your LLC and your your S corporation versus just insurance in place and what risk you're taking with regard to your personal financial situation and what you're trying to protect okay if you don't have anything don't go set up an entity to protect something that isn't there okay so if you got you know 20 grand in the bank and that's all you got don't go form an entity because some attorney told you you need it for liability protection okay so and there's partnerships and C corporations and uh, trusts and a ton of different entities that you can formulate and some are different depending on the state that you're doing business in, and they are beneficial in different states. So like in Tennessee, I don't want to own property in an LLC unless it's exempt there because I, there's a franchise and excise tax associated with it. So I have an exempt entity set up in, in that state. So self-directed IRAs and 401ks, great strategies on mitigating these, okay? So now keep in mind, there's two taxes inside of a self-directed IRA or 401k to be careful of. Unrelated business income tax. So if you are deemed as running a business in, inside of your 401k or IRA, there's typically 50% plus taxes that can be assessed on you for that. So that means if you're flipping a bunch of properties inside your IRA um, or actively involved in basically running a business um, outside of, if you're running the same business outside of your IRA that you are in, it looks really bad, right, to an IRS agent. So you be very, very careful of that. And there's case law and things like that that uh, uh, on flips. So you want to be very, very careful flipping properties inside your own IRA or 401k. And there's also what's called uh, UDFI, Unrelated Debt Financed Income Tax. Uh, this income tax is when you leverage investments. So if you buy a property, you can buy it inside your own 401k or IRA. But if you borrow month funds inside your IRA for this, then uh, you have to pay tax on the percentage that you borrowed. So if you bought a hundred thousand dollar property and put uh, and and borrowed seventy five thousand seventy five thousand or seventy five percent of it, then seventy five percent of that investment you will have to pay tax on. You'll get depreciation benefits on that seventy five percent, and uh, and and so you want to be really careful. And I typically recommend not to necessarily borrow funds inside of a self-directed IRA uh, just because of this issue because it costs a tax return and things like that. Uh, now when you're borrowing funds inside of a 401k this tax does not exist. It's amazing. So borrow, borrow, borrow all you want inside of a 401k at least at this point in time with the laws in place and it's it's a it's a loophole that you can you can utilize and be able to uh, really you know leverage funds. So I'll go through and borrow and I'll borrow against rental property, hold it for one year and then resell it. So I'm not flipping the property, I'm actually holding it long term. Okay. So prohibited parties, very important. Do not do business with lineal descendants, parents or kids or grandparents or grandkids or, or great and great. You be very careful about this. You don't want to do business with people that are your business partners and people with closely held relationships. It could be considered a prohibited party. So you do business with prohibited, prohibited parties, including yourself. You can't commingle your personal and uh, the business and and your 401k or IRA with you personally. Um, and you both cannot get 
what's called present benefit from each other. So technically, you can partner with your 401k or IRA, and you have to invest simultaneously at the same time. However, if you don't have all the money for the investment, or your IRA doesn't have 100% of the money for the investment, and you're combining, uh, combining investments to be able to take this down, then you're benefiting from each other. So if you're benefiting from each other, then uh, it's prohibited transaction. So you want to be very careful. If the total investment's 100 and you only have 50 and your IRA only has 50, then you can't do it together. But if you have 100 and your IRA has 100 and the investment is 100, so you could do it independently if you needed to, then technically you can do this. But be very, very careful and get an attorney's advice that specializes or a CPA's advice that specializes in these types of transactions. Uh, HSA accounts, I, I invest in real estate inside my o own health savings account, and I, and I build that up. You can pay your kids in different strategies and, and have that set up with a 401k for them. If you go pay your kids five grand a year uh, or six grand a year into, uh, into their account uh, for you know shredding for you or doing basic things for you, you can take that money now and uh, put it into a 401k or IRA for your child. And therefore, they pay no tax and you pay no tax on that money either. Okay. Uh, checkbook controlled LLC, very, very important to, to look at and be able to understand in detail. Okay. And then choosing the correct right custodian um, uh, is very important as well. Making sure you understand the fee structures involved, what they will allow you or not allow you to do. Okay. And then notes tax mitigation. Like I mentioned, there's no payroll taxes here on this. So, but sometimes you may be able to pay yourself a management fee to an LLC that owns all your notes. And when you do that, you create active income, ordinary income for yourself. And when you do that, then it allows you to then uh, write off some of those personal expenses like your cell phone and other expenses that could relate to the business against that income. Okay. So there's st other strategies you can utilize. So let's get a little bit into market timing because we're running behind a little bit here and I want to be able to get through this so that you guys can see the different uh, things that um, uh, on, the, on the market timing, the different things you can work with us on. So uh, market, there's, there's typically four different phases here. So phase one is the recovery phase, okay? So where you have typically a declining vacancy like we have right now. We don't see a lot of new construction. We're kind of seeing some new construction right now, uh, but at the same time, it's not all the way there, there yet. So personally, I feel that we're more in the expansion phase still, um, and we, we still have a declining vacancy rate. And then you have the hyper supply, the increased vacancy rate, and the new construction. When, when the builders start seeing it where it starts to make sense, when the vacancy rate gets low enough, uh, the the cost of the properties gets high enough to where it makes sense for the builders to build. And usually the builders are late to the party. So a lot of times they sell a lot early and then a lot later once it starts crashing as well. So under the new construction side. So that adds a lot of supply, but it takes a long time to add that supply to the inventory because it takes time to build uh, these, these, these lots out, these properties out to add that supply to the market. Okay. And then you have the recession phase, the increased vacancy, uh, more completions and more supply coming out, really, really flooding the market with supply over the demand. Okay. So, and right now I don't see a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there, there's not a lot of inventory on the market. I don't see a lot of new construction happening. We still have very, very good uh, um, affordability rates here in Southern California. Uh, so, you, you know, the, the, it looks very positive from a report standpoint, except for that, you know, there are things with the economy that don't make sense. Unemployment rate is higher. There's a lot of things that are different in this market than there were on the last, including international money that's coming in, things like that. Um, but there could be also something internationally that could make our entire market falter too. So there's a lot of risk in the market. At the same time, it looks like based on our normal cycles that we're in more still the expansion phase than anywhere else. I could be completely wrong on this, but just based on my analysis of the charts, that's what it looks like to me. So then we have the recovery phase, like I mentioned, high unemployment, decreased consumption, decreased investment in buildings and machinery, and the price of land is really, really low, okay, at that point. Demand for goods and services starts to recover some, and people start to hire more, and then governments lower interest rates to help push the market forward even further. At least that's what they think they're doing. Um, and that's slowly increasing the land values and declining vacancy rates in this period. In the expansion phase, we have new construction, 
companies and individuals have bought up or rented a lot of the building spaces, occupancy begins to exceed that long-term average. So that means that's pushing prices forward and up on rents, which then make it make it make more sense to put more development in place and add add more more units. And then rents start shooting up while waiting for the supply to hit the market because it takes that time to actually hit the market in the first place. Hyper supply, occupancy high when the, when you and you have the upward pressure on the rents. And as long as there's upward pressure on the rents, you're going to have that new construction, which is they're, they're basing it on future appreciation and things like that. Uh, the first indicator of trouble is hyper supply when you have too much unsold inventory on the market and vacancy um, uh, vacancies along with new construction coming on the market are starting to come out uh, more rapidly. Okay. Uh, recession, like I mentioned, the second indicator of trouble is when occupancy falls below the long term average. So there's downward pressure on rents and that's when the builders stop building when they see that downward pressure on rents which like I mentioned they're usually late to the party because they're analyzing the numbers of what happened previously and it's already in you know a recession. <clears throat> so third indicator of trouble is an increase in rates by the Federal Reserve to try to fight inflation um, which they're usually late to the party as well uh, and the vac vacancy starts to put real hard pressure on some of the landowners and re re revenues start to fall below the cost, the fixed cost, and then you start to have a lot of distressed deals coming in to pick up these bargain properties. So here's the typical cycles you see. So you can see major cycles from peak to peak. You're looking at basically 18, 18 years, 18 years, 17 years, 18. This one was 48, 6, 10, and 17, so from 2006. So we're, we're definitely due for a change in, in the peak market. But like I said, this could go on for 48 years. I doubt it. I really doubt it, but at the same time, keep keep this in mind when you're actually looking at these things that, you know, it's all relative. You don't know exactly when things are going to change, and you want to look at the charts more and more to uh, to determine what the best strategy is and, and what you're looking at at the time, uh, what type of investment to invest in at the time, and how to protect yourself. So you're looking at these markets saying, what is the best type of investment to invest at this time of the market? Am I going to get continual appreciation on the property? Am I not? You know, is there going to be a deflationary or inflationary market coming forward? So let's talk about finding the right investments for you personally. When you're analyzing your own financial situation, you have to know what your own risk tolerance level is, how comfortable are you in different scenarios, and learn how those risks are mitigated. How on every investment are your risks mitigated? So anybody you're investing with should be able to tell you that. Uh, determining how much time you have. Are you, act are you, are you going to be an active investor or a passive investor or both? I am both. There's definitely not enough time in the day to enact all the investments that I want to invest. So I have to invest passively. I bring in other active partners to do deals with as well. So there's a lot of different strategies you can deploy and you can be active and passive depending on what your situation is. What returns are you comfortable with? Are you aggressive in going to shoot for active returns um, or would you rather slowly accumulate that cash flow over time to gain that financial freedom? So active returns are obviously going to be providing you a higher return than passive returns. So at the same, and that's because it takes work. You're getting paid for your time. You're not necessarily getting paid for your money in that case. Okay, so look at active versus passive returns a little bit differently. Uh, do you understand how you're protected, like I mentioned? Do you have the capabilities to use bank leverage? What are your overall resources? How much cash? How much do you can you qualify for these types of financing? Do you have other relationships or other time that you can bring in to help put a deal together? Uh, do you do you have um, can you add value to different to the investment in different ways? And what are your current cash flow goals and your monthly expenses to cover uh, when you're determining what your what your strategy is going to be? Develop that plan so that you can actually put this in place for yourself. Okay. So ways to work with us. Okay. Investors can work with us by investing in single family homes. They'll typically make seven to ten percent returns in seller financing and bank financing with us, either through uh, joint ventures or, or buying a property themselves. They can invest and make 10 to 20 percent returns. Uh, cash returns are typically 7 to 10 percent returns on investment. Uh, we have wholesale deals 
to investors where we'll just go and wholesale a property and we can help with all the services on the back end uh, with wholesaling deals to investors that want to fix and flip them or fix to hold them as well. Um, and then we put together different property packages for investors as well where we'll go through and compile a list of 10 properties in a package and put a seller finance package together for them or we'll do, do a bank finance package together where we're we're partnering with investors on these. We also invest in different multifamily investments and that investors can make 10% plus on their money investing in multifamilies. Uh, there are promissory notes where investors can invest in short and long-term promissory notes at 8% returns. And you notice the properties typically provide a little bit higher return than the promissory notes. And that's because they are very, properties are much more active type investments than promissory notes. They're very passive. You don't have to do anything. You get a secured asset. You don't have to actually go through and worry about, you know, what's going on with the property as long as you're getting your monthly payment and you've done your homework and you have the right uh, system in place there. Uh, syndicated investments. Investors can invest with us in different syndicated investments and make 8 to 16% plus return on investments. And then we have an awesome awesome affiliate structure in place where people that want to work with us, uh, finding investors, raising capital, uh, finding properties, doing different strategies can make a hundred plus thousand dollars a year just working with us because and plugging in to our systems. Remember, we've been doing this for 10 years and we've done over 500 properties and we're constantly buying assets on an annual and monthly basis, whether it's multifamilies where there's tons of new deals coming up. So there's different strategies that you can implement uh, with us when you're working with us. And then we also help educate others. If you haven't already gone to it, check out our For Investors by Investors groups, okay? So we have the Long Beach group, we have our Manhattan Beach group that are both great groups to go to. We're doing both of them this month on flipping property, okay? We're doing more of an interview type format at my Long Beach group. That's going to be on the June 30th on flipping properties with Iris. She runs the Invest Club for Women in Irvine. And then she's been a longtime experienced flipper. And then we have a panel of flipping experts coming in to talk for Manhattan Beach uh, on June 14th where we have uh, actually people coming in and, and we're going to do a panel of Q&A with the audience. You can come get your questions answered and you can see our websites there at meetup.com forward slash for investors by investors or meetup.com forward slash for FIBI South Bay. You can also go to forinvestorsbyinvestors.com and you'll see all of our different chapters throughout Southern California that you can attend. And then we do a ton of these types of webinars that we'll have re recorded for you as well that you can review later. And we do different real estate topics. We do live brunch and learns on different topics. We have affiliate training segments that are coming soon for our affiliates that can understand all of our investment methods, all the due diligence that needs to be done on investments, how we protect our investors, all of that stuff is coming soon. And then we have a lot of podcasts and blogs that you can uh, read and get educated on. I, I strictly run my business around education. So, uh, and, and I think it's extremely valuable to continue to educate people uh, for myself because I learn it better when I'm educating. And at the same time for my investors, I love doing this for investors and trying to help them, you know, strategize with this on their deals. So that being said, next steps. Email or call us and schedule an appointment. We, we'll go over a 30-minute financial co consultation with you and go over your specific financial situation, which starts with filling out a client intake sheet with us, compiling what resources you have for investment purposes, reviewing the specific cash flow goals and expenses to cover. So you got to come with these types of uh, expenses in place and we will help you with your financial situation. Okay. So then we review the investment options, whether it's investing with us or on your own, outside of us, we'll walk you through what strategies might work for you. Determine what types of investments are right for your specific situation and start, honestly, it's just, it's that easy. Start developing your cash flow stream and continue that education through our For Investors by Investors Network. So that being said, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. That's all you guys need to do in order to get started with us or get started learning and getting educated on your, your own financial situation and getting on the way to your cash flow strategies. We also, I'm willing to sit down with anybody on the line right now to go over specifically, like I mentioned, their financial situation and even just educate more on the strategies that we do. So um, that, that way you can really, really focus on yourself and, and how that might work. And I know we have some questions here, uh, but at the same time, I'm going to hold those off until later on because we're over time. So uh, I just want to be able to... Uh, 
uh, answer those offline and, and cut off like uh, on time if I can, which is we're already a little bit over over uh, time. So thank you guys very much uh, for your time today. I appreciate it. Go ahead and email us at invest at ocgproperties.com or you can give us a call at 424-757-4680. Look forward to talking to you guys soon and have a great uh, night. Appreciate it. Talk soon.